telling a developing story. This was a guy who came from a small town in Mississippi and basically lived the American dream. Hello, folks. Hope you are having a great time. Netflix has been doing a great job with its documentaries, highlighting buried instances of injustice and mystery. The hit sports documentary series Untold kicked off its fourth season with an episode dealing with the triumphant life and tragic death of NFL star quarterback Steve Air McNair. As such, the series is devoted to bringing out the dark moments that have happened in the sports world throughout the years and has given us three seasons that have received high ratings. Naturally, the expectations for season four are also sky high. Any event of unnatural death of well-known sports persons is as intriguing as it is shocking. The murder of Eric McNair took all NFL fans and enthusiasts by surprise. The football star had a very illustrious professional career and gathered considerable fame and wealth. He was also somewhat of a family man, with four children in total. People close to him have also remarked that Steve was quite the player and had relationships with various women over the years, despite being married. Sounds like your mainstream celebrity, right? As it turned out, his tragic demise had nothing to do with nefarious intent. Unlike many people in sports who found their lives cut short due to issues with drugs or the wrong side of the law, Steve had no apparent problems of that kind. Perhaps his main vice was being unable to keep himself grounded with a single partner. He probably just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. In today's video, we will be deconstructing the life of Steve Air McNair, as shown in the Netflix documentary and various other sources we have gathered. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Who is Steve McNair? In his prime, Steve McNair was a force to be reckoned with and remembered to this day for being one of the best that football has ever seen. Just like many other legends of the game, he had pretty humble roots. Born Stephen Latrell McNair on February 14, 1973 in Mount Olive, Mississippi, he had four brothers, out of which Fred was also a professional football player. In fact, NFL linebacker Demario Davis is a cousin of Steve. He attended Mount Olive High School and was proficient in football, basketball, baseball, and running track. Having all the signs of an athletic genius in him, it was no surprise that he chose to pursue sports professionally. He was nicknamed Air McNair in high school. During his junior year, he led the Mount Olive Pirates to a state championship. McNair's College Statistics Due to his immense talent and potential, Steve was offered a full scholarship to the University of Florida as a running back. Anyone familiar with this system of college in the United States would know just how good one would have to be to be offered a scholarship. However, Steve decided to attend Alcorn State University instead because he wanted to play quarterback. ASU is a historically black university as well, having been established before the Civil Rights Act of 1964, primarily to cater to African Americans. In 1992, McNair started his season with his college team in a very impressive manner, throwing for 3,541 yards and 29 touchdowns. Despite battling numerous injuries, he was instrumental in the team's qualification for the 1AA playoffs. During his time in college, he was named first team all swack for three consecutive years. His senior season was even more impressive as he gained a combined total of 6,281 yards and 56 touchdowns. This made him surpass numerous records, and he gained his moniker All-America. He also won the Walter Payton Award as the best 1AA player and finished third in the Heisman Trophy. In fact, the records he had set for career passing, total offensive yards, and total number of plays remain unbroken to this date. His career passing completions, however, were broken by Devlin Hodges in 2018. An ardent member of the fraternity, Omega Sci-Fi, McNair had the words Omega Man tattooed on his arm. He was the star that people want to see. McNair's professional career. In the 1995 NFL Draft, the newly appointed head coach of the Houston Oilers, Jeff Fisher, selected Steve, making him the highest drafted African-American quarterback in NFL history at the time. He signed a seven-year contract initially. While McNair did not see a lot of action initially, being a backup mainly until late 1996, his first season with the Oilers began in 1997. His amazing 2,665 passing yards were the most for the team in a long time. The next year, he set more career passing highs, improving his quarterback rating steadily. The 1999 Super Bowl season was significant in McNair's career, and the team changed their name from the Oilers to the Titans. Injuries kept the man busy, being diagnosed with an inflamed disc initially and having to miss a few games. However, he made a triumphant return, 
soon enough and was instrumental in advancing the Titans through the season. He signed a new six-year contract after this, worth a whopping $47 million. In the 2000-2001 season, injuries resurfaced, making it somewhat difficult for Steve to remain consistent. However, he kept pushing forward, and many critics deem his 2001 season to be the most productive one of his professional career. He was also named to the Pro Bowl for the first time. In the 2002 season, McNair and the Titans were able to get to the AFC Championship game, but were unable to qualify for the Super Bowl. He was arrested for DUI and illegally possessing a gun in May 2003, but the charges were later dropped. The 2003 season, famously dubbed McNair's MVP season, was fraught with even more injuries, but the man still managed to make an extremely impressive mark. The best numbers of his career were seen during this time, including 3,215 passing yards, 24 touchdown passes, 7 interceptions, and a stellar quarterback rating of 100.4. He was named NFL MVP along with Colts quarterback Peyton Manning and became the youngest player in the history of the NFL to pass for 20,000 yards and run for 30,000 yards. The seasons of 2004 and 2005 were not very kind to Steve who had to sit out for most of the games due to repeated injuries. This made the team take the executive decision to lock him out of the headquarters, as they were wary of having to pay him a hefty sum of $23.46 million in case he suffered more injuries. Due to his exceptional performance, his salary cap had reached a pretty hard-to-manage amount. However, all hope was not lost, since the Players Association stepped up on his behalf and filed a grievance, which opened up the possibility of a trade. In 2006, it was rumored that the Baltimore Ravens were interested in McNair. After some deliberations, he was officially inducted as a member of the Ravens. In 2006 and 2007, he continued his impressive streak for the Ravens, but it was getting quite obvious that he was not the player he used to be. This was not all on him, of course. The sheer number of injuries he had sustained in his entire career certainly was taking a toll on him. His performance was stellar, no doubt, but his fans probably held him to a much higher standard. In 2007, McNair was arrested in Nashville for drunk driving, even though he was not the one driving the car. In Tennessee, it is a misdemeanor offense for a person owning a vehicle to knowingly allow another intoxicated person to drive it. Therefore, he was charged with DUI by consent. The charges were later dropped when his brother-in-law pleaded guilty to reckless driving. That year, he again missed a number of games due to injuries, but the Ravens performed well. Following the season, he announced his retirement from the NFL. Ask any ardent football fan about Aaron McNair, and everyone would unanimously agree that he was one of the best players to have graced the game. His performance throughout his career, right from his college to professional league, was nothing short of stellar, and despite having battled numerous serious injuries, he always made his game look effortless. What happened to him? Steve McNair was married to Michelle McNair on June 21, 1997, until his death. He had two sons with Michelle named Tyler and Trent. However, he had two more sons from relationships before he got married. Stephen Latrell McNair Jr. and Stephen O'Brien McNair. People close to him knew that he was not exactly the ideal spouse, since he had many relationships with different women while he was married. On July 4, 2009, McNair breathed his last. His body was found with multiple gunshot wounds, along with the body of a woman named Sahel Kazemi, also known as Jenny. Steve was 36 years old at the time, and Jenny was 20. The pair had been together for a while, and she was probably one of his many mistresses. He was shot four times, while Jenny had a single shot to her head. She was a waitress at Dave & Buster's, a restaurant in a mall that McNair would frequently visit. The bodies of the two were found by McNair's friends, Robert Gaddy and Wayne Neely, who had called 911. The police interviewed numerous people in association with both McNair and Jenny. Wayne Neely was interviewed on suspicion because he had called 911 but had left the scene before the police could arrive. Robert Gaddy was also interviewed because it was found that he had argued with the ex-football star over money related to a joint business venture. Moreover, Kazemi's ex-boyfriend, Kenneth Norfleet, was also interviewed as a potential suspect. Who killed him? Where is his killer now? The Nashville police found a break in the case when they came across Adrian Gilliam, a felon who had reportedly sold Jenny the gun which happened to be the murder weapon. While he initially claimed to have no connection with her, it was later found out that the pair had exchanged many calls and text messages in the weeks that led up to the death of McNair and Jenny. There was some suspicion that Gilliam was involved in the murder in a greater capacity, given his criminal background. Ultimately, though, the police ruled the tragic incident to be a murder-suicide by an emotionally and financially distraught Sahel Kazemi. The pair were found in a condo rented by the football player in downtown Nashville. On the day of the fateful incident, the pair had shared many text messages, in which both of them had claimed to be in love with the other. Jenny had also mentioned that she was under a lot of stress, both emotional and financial, 
and McNair had transferred $2,000 to her so she could pay her phone bill. Among other possible things, he had also offered to come and check up on her. After she had revealed that her chest was feeling heavy, he had put his children to bed at night and then went over to see her. He was believed to have been sleeping on the couch when he was shot, twice in his body and twice in his head. After having killed him, Jenny sat beside his body on the couch and shot herself in the head. The 9mm gun was found under her body and she had traces of gunpowder residue in her left hand. Since she herself is dead, there is no way for people to know the real motive behind her killing McNair. However, the documentary paints a picture of a very fragile person in Jenny. She was born in Tehran, Iran, and had lost her mother to a robbery gone bad at the age of nine. She immigrated to the United States when she was 13, living with an older sister in Jacksonville, Florida. However, she was unable to blend into American society and dropped out of high school, ultimately moving to Nashville where she met McNair. It is widely believed that Kazemi was indebted heavily and depended on Steve not just emotionally, but also for monetary support. She had discovered that he was possibly involved with more women when she had seen a lady leave his home while she knew he was married. The news that she was not the only other woman in his life came as quite a bit of a shock to her. McNair was a good sportsman and father but he was a rather complicated person when it came to his personal affairs. He was not at all faithful to his wife and had a lot of relationships over the years. Kazemi was simply one of his mistresses, as he was reported to be with multiple women at once. His friend Gaddy talks about this tendency, saying that he had an itch to scratch and simply could not control himself. Sonia knew one of Kazemi's co-workers, told authorities that just a day before the shooting, Jenny had told her she wanted to end her life. She was not clear why but it can be assumed that it was because of her mental condition along with the crippling debt, and possibly the knowledge of knowing that the man she was involved with was not loyal to her. It should also be remembered that she was only 20 at the time of her death, and as such, most of us know how tumultuous those years in life can be. The Netflix documentary portrays her in a rather sympathetic light, as a woman burdened by finances and emotional anguish, who may have wanted her lover all to herself, and since she could not have that in life, she chose to be with him in death. Just two days before their deaths, Kazemi and McNair were pulled over. She was arrested for DUI, but he was not, and he had left her to be arrested, despite her repeatedly asking him to help her with the police. However, he later did bail her out. After getting out, Kazemi purchased the gun that was used to murder him and kill herself. The documentary shows police investigation footage that does not reveal anything in particular, except what is already known about the deaths. There were photographs of the crime scene and the bloodied gun, and notes of the lead detective on the case, Charles Robinson. The case was quite sensational, especially because adultery became the chief theme of the murder. Many critics have mentioned how because of this element, the police had not done their best and only zeroed in on the sensational aspects. Many other suspects were not interviewed thoroughly enough. It is not completely unfounded or impossible for Jenny to have killed the football star and herself, but people feel that this version is somehow too simplistic and reduces the case to a mere lover's spat. McNair was a well-known and wealthy public figure who was also a notorious philanderer, so suspicion initially went on his wife as well. However, the evidence of gunpowder residue on Jenny's hand was all the proof the police needed to rule this as a murder-suicide. The documentary interviewed Vincent Hill, a private investigator who had appealed for the case to be reopened and re-examined, and written books on Steve McNair. He believes that Gilliam was the main suspect and had some motive to kill both, and the police did not pay much attention to him. It is noteworthy to mention here that Gilliam was involved in not just any crime earlier, but a murder, which could mean he had experience with the matter. In 2010, Hill tried to reopen the case with the grand jury trying to convict Gilliam but they refused due to a lack of solid evidence. Gilliam himself was requested to be interviewed for the documentary, but refused. The case remains closed, but opinions still vary. Many people believe Kazemi was not a stone-hearted killer because she also killed herself. She was simply a very troubled woman who was possibly depressed and stressed and wanted a way out. Some other people disagree with this and believe that even if she was facing issues, she had no right to kill McNair, someone who had a family, even though his loyalty to them was questionable. And there are others who believe that all of this was an elaborate cover-up and that Jenny and Steve were both killed by a third person who had unknown motives. Ultimately, the documentary does not play the role of a judge and does not implicate anyone other than Jenny. Rodney Lucas, Taylor Alexander Ward, the directors of the series, wanted to make this episode not only about his untimely death, but also about his glorious career. They said that even though he was a brilliant man, he became just another black man in America who was shot and killed. He was much more than that and the aim of the documentary was to humanize him and throw light on his career, which many people overlook just because he was killed. He was a gifted and hard-working football player who was somewhat camera-shy and team-oriented. His spectacular long passes remained legendary, and he was known to be a risk-taker, 
because he was fond of running with the ball, a move that most NFL quarterbacks try to avoid because of the chances of injury. After his death, the Titans and Ravens expressed their condolences publicly and fondly remembered McNair for his outstanding contributions to both teams. The Titans held a two-day memorial for fans to pay their last respects to the man and signed books that were later handed over to his family. During the 2009 NFL season, every member of the Titans wore a commemorative, nine sticker on the back of their helmets to pay homage to Steve McNair. The man died without a last will and testament, and therefore, his assets were frozen. In 2010, his widow appealed to a judge in Nashville to unfreeze a part of his assets for his children's care and expenses, and her request was granted when each of his four kids received some money. Marvelous Verdict Netflix's documentary goes at a somewhat brisk pace, but does not really uncover anything beyond what is already known to the public. As the directors had envisioned, this was on purpose, because the aim was to celebrate his life and talk about his death, but not focus completely on the latter. However, there is one revelation that comes across as extremely moving. During the Super Bowl game when the final whistle blew and the Titans lost by a small margin, Steve was naturally distraught and it sunk down to the ground. The coach of the team, Jeff Fisher, was seen whispering something in his ear at that time, which he had refused to disclose. However, in the documentary, he mentions that they were just saying that they loved each other. Most people in Air McNair's life have nothing to say except good words. His former teammates wish that he was known for more than just his death. He was not a virtuous man, maybe, but he was good at his job and needed to work on his vices. Ultimately, people believe it was his unrestrained womanizing ways that possibly led to his untimely demise. That is it for today, folks. Let us know if there are any other documentaries you would like us to cover. We will be back with another marvelous video soon. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe.